It is 840 News Talk, Saga 960 Raw. Mike Richards along with David Bastel. And there are many things we've talked about. And of course, we have some, and one in particular, a staunch Flyers fan. Uh, and uh, Hall of Fame Alex is, uh, of course, you know, I, I'm not sure at this current moment what the uh, avatar is on the Twitter account, but uh, safe to say, uh, Gritty is going to show up uh, uh, quite often who has uh, taken the world by a uh, stage and our storm. And you also have an area in Toronto and its history with the Philadelphia Flyers goes back, depending on your age group. The seventies was a particularly turbulent time and a, and a, a time as being a young kid that was actually frightening to, to, to play the Flyers in that time. So that's where the, blood was all over the ice and Boria Salming's face was cut up and Roy McMurtry wanted to actually have legal action against the Philadelphia Flyers for assault and all these other kinds of things. And uh, you also look at what the, the broad street bullies were at that time going all the way through that roster and then seeing that white Jacques Plante goalie mask on Bernie Perrant. That might've been the scariest thing of all, because what that meant was no one's scoring there. It's funny. As you go through the generations of playing ball hockey or pickup hockey, you would maybe make a comment about, about your goaltender, right? So either he was really, really good, you called him a name, or you were mocking him and you used a really, really good name. In my era, it was always Bernie Perron or just Bernie. That's the only name you had to say because that was the standard. There's so much that has gone into the Flyers. I think it's really cool that we have Larry Clay this morning. Uh, who has been a long time a fan of uh, the Flyers. Behind the Orange Curtain is the book, and he joined us here this morning. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Uh, well, we're doing great, and I just think that uh, it's just so much. I mean, some teams, you, you, you can just look at the X's nose of a team. You can, But when it comes to the Philadelphia Flyers, from its reputation, from its fans, from its different buildings, from its successes, there is a lot to this uh, – behind the orange curtain uh yeah there is a lot but you know there's always a lot behind every story and it's not what people will always see in the newspapers newspapers back then today on social media and um and you know i was involved in in some different aspects and different relationships with them and uh, i cover that in the first three the first three chapters of the book yeah Larry, let's let's dig into it a little bit. <clears throat> you talk about it a little bit in the forward, uh, and and you have a lot of I, I guess a lot of people say the dirt behind a lot of the stories, a lot of opinion as well, a lot of facts too, because you back up everything with with legalized paperwork and, and so forth. But what made you finally put pen to paper, so to speak? Obviously, this is more of a laptop of, of event for you, I'm sure. But what made you write the book? And what was uh, the final push where you thought, okay, I'm going to do it because I, I either have to do it or I have to quit thinking about it at all? Yeah, it was a point where most of the information was sitting in a briefcase for almost 30 years, you know, the first yeah. three chapters. And I, I was like, well, you know, I got to get rid of this stuff and or do something with it. Really, I thought the chances of doing something with it when I started looking at it was remote, one in a million. And I read it over and went, you know, I think people would be interested in hearing this, even though it's some of the things are older. So what? People read history books every day and people in the Philadelphia area, especially. And it's not just about the Flyers book. It goes well beyond that. But I think they like, you know, a lot of people are still connected to Flyers from 30 years ago, to Broad Street Bullies et cetera, et cetera. And, and some of the things that went on uh, behind the scenes. And <clears throat> I was involved in, as it says, you know, three different situations. So uh, I got a good view of what really went on. Plus I knew a lot of people that worked for the Flyers being in the hockey business and the hockey industry. And I had coached for years. So my aspect was a little different. I wrote it like just in the early nineties, uh, uh, right after this was happening. And, uh, and I thought it would be interesting, but I knew I would have to rewrite it. It was a little too harsh. You know, well, and, and it, cause it seems like, and I guess the way to describe the book is just trying to get the record straight. Is, is that the way you would describe this book? Yes. Yeah, uh, other people would say, uh, um, 
I was mad, but not really. I took the emotion out of it for, as far as I could see. But yeah, I did want to get some of the records straight. I especially was upset and I've always let it burn with me that the situation where the Flyers drafted Mike Ricci over Yammer Yager, and that's all caused by the owner allowing his son to fire Bobby Clark, who would have drafted Yammer Yager. And so that always stuck in my craw because I knew how good a player Yager was. We all do. Yeah, you know, Hockey News just rated him 19th best in history. Uh, if the Flyers had Yager and Mike Ricci was a good player, but, you know, Yager is one of the best in history. Uh, so there were a lot of things that went on and people think these pro organizations are run perfectly. You well know in Toronto that that certainly doesn't happen. It doesn't happen anywhere. It kind of bothered me. That, you know, the average fan doesn't know about that or even people who play hockey don't know about that. Larry you you dig into a lot of different subjects subjects I love the Tim Kerr chapter uh the Schneider family appears throughout the book at times Bobby Clark who's a, a Manitoba born player that I, I followed as a kid um I, I'm kind of curious and, and you and you touch on it a little bit throughout the book on the different relationships but how would you describe the Schneider family and Bobby Clark? Because it, it, it starts early as a player and, and it kind of comes and goes as everybody starts to age. And, and sometimes Clark is loved. Sometimes he's hated. He's been fired. He's been brought back. I'm not going to say he's the Billy Martin of the Philadelphia Flyers because I don't think there is a Billy Martin out there in hockey that has come back seven or eight times. But Bobby Clark's kind of uh, that, that lifetime flyer that's had a lot of mistreatment and a lot of uh, pedestal as well in, in that stage of life. Yeah, it's funny you say that because one of the hardest parts of it, writing was I had to take out so much of the book and I ha actually had that comparison in there. I actually mentioned the closest thing I've ever seen to this is, you know, Martin and the <laughs> New York Yankees. And it, it was for four or five year periods back and forth, back and forth. And then, you know, Snyder realizes that he can't run this club without Clark. Uh, uh, so he brings him back. And within a, two years, you know, understand the cup final. But uh, Clark then, his skills as a general manager were really good. They were close to Hall of Fame skills. They deteriorated a little bit because he got frustrated and they nicknamed him Trader Bob. But uh, it's the same thing with the Snyders and their image. People think that the Flyers were great. Uh, had great ownership because the, the team was always near the top, it, you know, year to year. And they generally were, but they, they had a lot of trouble since 75 of getting over the, getting over the top and getting back. And so I just don't think the image and anybody who knows who works for them, uh, so many people know that that image really, uh, of them being a great ownership group, but, uh, you know, isn't really true. And, and yeah. so, you know, that's, and of course, really in writing, it's my opinion, you know, others would share that, I guarantee you, but that's all I was trying to portray in there. And, um, you know, but still he had the knowledge. And uh, as I said, in, in the 1990 draft issue of Hockey News right there, and he had talked about Yager and when time came, he wasn't there because he had been fired and they bring in a Russ Farwell with no NHL experience and let Snyder lets his son run the draft with Russ Farwell, and that's really good. <laughs> that's really turns into a, a disaster that relates a little bit uh, later into the Lindor draw trade. You know, and you know, I don't you know if you remember what a what a crazy you know time that was. You know? yeah. and, and they end up trading really Mike Ricci, who would would have been, you know, none of that would have happened. And, as I said in the book too, I'm not the biggest Lindros fans either. I mean, he was a good player, but so it, it was, there were a lot of debacles that occurred with the Flyers and trading players, you know? Yeah. And that's what I wanted people to know. And I want them to think that's a perfect history because it's certainly far from that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, when you look at, uh, say, a, a Flyers fan, and, and in each city, there are certain traits that I probably would attribute to a fan base for a lot of NHL teams here in Toronto, uh, as much as there's a fervor for it and so on. But they do have a certain image. And to me, it's regardless of what goes on when it was back in Maple Leaf Gardens, now the Scotiabank, um, they're showing up anyway, Larry. They're just going. It doesn't really oh, yeah. matter. They're just, they're just showing up. They could have the worst team, worst management coaches that are i mean they've, they've done it all here in toronto Absolutely. over the years and they're showing up 
a flyer fan are they are they served well by the team itself like are they are they showing because i don't think they're a quiet fan base I, at least that's my image of uh, or my perception of a flyer fan is that they're very vocal and if they are unhappy with the team they, they'd have no problem booing a team that would never happen here or very rarely here in toronto well now in philadelphia I, I think you have to sign a contract when you go in to the arena that when things go bad you better be booing I mean, that's just, what, that's just what the Philadelphia fan is known for. You go to a Phillies game or an Eagles game, and yes. people people express their displeasure. Believe me, they express their displeasure with fans from other teams that happen to be there and on their territory. And I've been to stadiums all over the country and in Canada, and there's nothing quite like the Philadelphia fan. And, uh, and I'm not saying they're always right, because they're not. Uh, but they, they, they're very frustrated at people here are even currently are, are very frustrated and uh, uh, you're, you're right in other stadiums I laugh sometimes when I see things going bad and get the fans they seem to always be positive you know which is which is a good thing and then where you're at I mean that's the hockey capital of the world anybody who knows hockey knows that and uh, uh, Toronto's been a long time for their their last Stanley Cup that's for sure yeah yeah, and so, yeah, uh, it's an attitude thing, you know. Yeah, we, we've heard about it big time here too. <laughs> well, it's all, let me tell you something. It's all true, and I've seen <laughs> things. We would have to have another program on just to tell you some of the fights <laughs> I've seen with Rangers and Flyers fans, and Eagles and Cowboys fans, and some pretty spectacular action. Believe me, well, and not, I, I'm not I, condoning I, what the Philadelphia fans do either. Believe me, the, I'm not. The, Larry, I had, I had a conversation with Jeff Garcia one time. Who <laughs> talked about his time in Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah. And he, he said he's just he'd never really experienced anything like that. And he goes, and those are my fans. Like yeah. they're, they're supposed they're supposed to be cheering for me. And he goes, yeah. And, and well, you know what? Not, though, <laughs> I'll tell you this: when things go right, there's no one that supports their team better than the Flyers. They may it's just over the top when they do. They just express to you what's you know it's what have you done for me lately, and they're just. You know, it's just that type of thing that they're going to let you know where you stand. And that just never changes, you know. It's maybe a little less now. I think the environments, even at hockey games, uh, are not what they once were because there's a, you know, it used to be a long time ago, people went to a lot of games. You know, it was a lot of the same people at games. And today, more of what I call cor corporate atmosphere where yeah. – uh, you know, nobody goes to every game. It's just too hard to do and too expensive. Mm -hmm. So you don't see the rowdiness there as much. I don't see it like I did at some of the older arenas that were closer to the ice. Yeah. And, you know, that type of thing. Larry, final question, a uh, two-part question, because Christmas is around the corner. This is an awesome book to pick up for Christmas. Uh, I have read it start to finish. Uh, it's an easy read as well. Uh, I, I like the tense that you put it into, so I compliment you on that. Where can people where can people find this book? And have you received any feedback from some of the people that you've talked about in this book, or people that have read it and had, whoa, what about this, Larry, and, or anything like that? Because a lot of times oh, yeah. you throw something out there, somebody's going to say something good or bad to you. So first off, where can they find the book? And uh, any feedback, sir? Well, really the easiest, even for anybody in Canada or the United States, is right on um, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people get it within a, a day and a half, two days if they have Prime. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it's an easy pickup uh, there because it's done in a fashion. I self-publish, so it's done on, uh, uh, you know, where it's print on demand, what they call print on demand. So today... Anybody can write a book, good, bad, mm. ugly. Uh, I did write it in the way you said, David. It was more to me. I was I write it, wrote it in such a way where I'm telling it to you like we're talking now. That's what I exactly. try. Exactly. Simple, person to person, not a lot of fancy language. And yeah, I've had some feedback. There are people that you know, and they, I've read a lot of other quote tell all books that didn't tell you anything. Oh, correct. I put <laughs> I put names in there, you know. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think I incriminated myself. I wrote what people told me for the most part. 
unless they were things that I was personally involved with, you know? Yeah. And uh, if you want to read a little Canadian heritage of my thing, my uh, idea is read chapter four. You can read the book in any context, like open it up in all the chapters. They're not connected. You, you know that if you read it, that, that they're all separate stories. So you could read it that way in chapter four. It includes Gretzky and Rick Tockett and some things that they did wrong that they would not have gotten away with with social media today. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, um, that, 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 yeah, that goes for a lot of yeah, hockey shot, players. I'm is, talking, yeah, I'm talking to, I talking to Derek Sanders and they said, man, <laughs> it's a, you, and you didn't even have uh, cameras with phones on them back then. So uh, consider yourself lucky. That's yeah. Well, I got everything on chapter four off the internet yeah. and, and, you know, Sanderson's book is original book. I got to be made is written like that too. He just sort of talks to, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's what I tried to do. It, and I haven't done a done an audio book yet, and a full out, really long, large campaign marketing because of just the way scheduling has been with hockey and other sports. But I plan on starting that in January. It oh, that just takes a long time to get something yeah. out there, and people don't know you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Larry, thanks so much for this morning. Been uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, the book certainly uh, right in time for Christmas too. For uh, and you don't have to be a Flyer fan. I mean, that's the thing. No, you no, that's have the whole to be. Thing. That, I don't, yeah, I don't you don't think have so. to. Be. No, I think there's no. things in the book that everybody will identify with if they're a hockey person. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Larry, uh, have yourself a great Christmas. Thanks so much for joining us, and we really appreciate the time here this morning. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope to see you guys again somewhere. Abs down yeah, absolutely. Of course we would. That is uh, Larry Clay. Uh, Behind the Orange Curtain is the name of the book. Interesting stuff here this morning. We're going to do traffic one more time before we go. It's 8.57. Here's Dave. Yeah, search it on Amazon if you want to pick up a very, very good book. Uh